Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 59 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, and that is Gavin. And Gavin, I know we're a, a science podcast, but did you watch any of the NFL this past weekend? I sure didn't. Uh, I There are very few things that I care about less than football, although I will say many of my friends are very sad. <laughs> that much I do know. Yeah, so look, look it. Look it. I'm not a big football guy. The NFL is not really my thing. I'll freely admit that, and I don't apologize for it. But hot damn, this weekend featured a lot. All four games, I think, were walk-offs. They go down to the last second. They're going into overtime. Oh, I didn't know that. There's all these. All, it was it was a great weekend of football games. And the, the kicker on top was the uh, was the Bills-Chiefs um, game. That mm-hmm. was... It, you know, it went overtime. There was four scores in the last two minutes of regulation. See, I Just, couldn't even have told you who the Bills were playing. I knew that they were <laughs> because my Facebook feed wouldn't shut up about it. Uh, nope, no, it would not. <laughs> two two people um, that live in central New York. Yeah. So I just wanted to to make that acknowledgement that, look, I get it. We do science here. We're nerdy stuff. Like, you know, we were the kids that got shoved into lockers. You know, when we were younger, we didn't play sports. But damn, this was a great weekend of football. I played sports. I sort of I, but like I wasn't good at them. <laughs> <sighs> but yeah, so I I'm very sincerely sorry to uh, all of my Buffalo Bill yep. friends and and listeners to the podcast. But I hope the Super Bowl. Wait, because that that's the next one, right? No, there's uh, one more game and then the Super Bowl. God, how long? Is football like I know that I know the games take eight years, give or take, but God, the season like anyway, whatever. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I believe there's four total rounds, if I remember correctly. Okay, um, so yeah, they're going in. It's sort of you know the semifinals or the conference championships is going to be coming up this next week. Okay, but uh, we don't care about any of that, we care sure about don't. some science stuff. So before we get into that, um, just really quick at today in history, um. Me and Gavin, it took me quite a while to find anything for today. I'm not going to lie. What I find? Not good. Um, but <laughs> January 26th in history. Today in 1837, Michigan was admitted as the 26th state into the Union. So this wouldn't put us over the halfway mark for where we currently are. Oh, Michigan neat. Michigan is the 26th state. Yeah. So um, I'm oh, not sure we, when we actually get... have some some listeners from Michigan. Do we well. really? Yeah. Well, hello. Hello, everybody from Michigan. Go uh, Tigers and Lions. I suppose. Um, but yeah, there, not, there wasn't a whole lot good, but you guys were the best thing available to me on January 26th. Well, that's, so, uh, that's better than nothing, I guess. This is true. So with my part of the podcast out of the way now, uh, <laughs> Gavin, what the hell are we talking about today? So today we are talking about the end or division mass extinction. So we, we have discussed this before, correct? We've talked about mass extinctions a bit. So this was mm-hmm. also featured in our uh, 600 million years in 60 slash 120 minutes. This was in the first part of that. Uh, and this is the first mass extinction uh, to happen since we've been having major complex life on the planet. Uh, and so my sort of one of my long running goals for this podcast was to have an episode about each geologic period. Uh, or maybe even when we get a little more recent, maybe get a, even a little more granular than that. Um, and so for reason, that's going to be a little difficult for reasons I'll sort of explain toward the end. But okay. episode 50, we talked about the Cambrian explosion and the Cambrian period. Uh, and the Ordovician is the period that comes right after the Cambrian. So um, like I said, this is sort of a longer running goal of the podcast. And mm-hmm. uh most periods have something, usually like one single big event in them. Uh, some of them don't, which are some of the harder ones that I'm going to have to try to come up with something to talk about, but <laughs> we'll get there when we get there. Sure. So, the Ordovician period ran from 485 to 444 million years ago. So, give or take 40 million years. Pretty long time. Uh, yeah. And so this is the second period of the Phanerozoic Eon, 
the eon of Earth history where we have complex multicellular life and ecosystems. And also the second period of the Paleozoic era, you know, paleo meaning old, zoic meaning life. This is the first sort of big chunk of the Phanerozoic where things would look familiar-ish, but definitely not like today. Okay. So a little so bit. I would, I would recognize the planet as Earth, but not my Earth. Well, it would depend on where you were. Understood. For, re- for reasons we'll explain. All right. When you say we, well, I mean you. I'm, I'm saying the, the royal we, you, the podcast, will oh, explain so to the listener. you're just bestowing the monarchy upon yourself while I'm a court jester here <laughs> making wise cracks today in history. All right. I see where I stand. So, a little bit about the Earth <laughs> at this time. Because <laughs> it's really important, as with anything uh, in geology, when you're talking about the life, it's really important to understand like the, the conditions that they were living in as well. Um, so the earth was, uh, really heavily inundated with water. This was there. The sea levels were really, really high. Um, on average throughout the period, it was around 180 meters above today. 180 meters above today. That seems give or take 600 feet above today. That seems really significant. Like That's not very just... significant. That is extremely high. That's some of the highest right. uh, since we've had, you know, multicellular life. This is some of the highest it will ever be. I mean, this. Is, so that's one thing, just as a quick uh, digression, like when we're talking about anything, whether it's years or distance or anything else, I always, like, I always want to make sure I have that in context. Like, is this number significant or not? Because it might sound yes. bigger, than it, but like that's, I, just, I always just want to make sure that I have that you know, unwrap. So like 180 meters is what you said? Yes. I mean, that's, there's quite a lot of land we recognize today in major cities that just would not exist. If oh, absolutely. If sea levels, you know, tomorrow just rose that much. Yeah. And like, you know, a couple times a week when I drive, you know, cause I'm currently still in the hotel room in the desert. Um, every time that I drive from my apartment out to the desert or back, most of the route that I take uh, is under 600 feet in elevation so that would all be completely underwater um pretty much you know most i'd say most cities and globally because people tend to live near water uh most big cities globally would be underwater that that's a big part of why if if you were you would recognize this as earth that why i was kind of like oh it might depend might depend where you were (laughs) okay fair enough um, if that was in Nebraska, or the equivalent of Nebraska at this time. Probably-ish, but again, we'll, we'll get there. Um, but again, so that was just an average. So at various points, mostly toward the beginning, uh, it, was, it could have been up to 220 meters above today. So probably closer to 700 feet. Um, and it could have been at various points as low as about 140 meters, um, which is still really high. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, this is this is all massive. Like, yeah, that, that's all I have to say is that this yeah. is as big as it sounds, especially in the context of when we're talking about, you know, like climate change and sea levels rising, and we're mm-hmm. talking about, you know, like a couple dozen feet or something. Like it, th- these are just staggering numbers in comparison to what we normally discuss. Right, and a big part of that, as we'll see, is that a. Um, toward the beginning of the period, it was really hot. The Cambrian period and the beginning of the Ordovician, as it sort of went from Cambrian to Ordovician, was just very hot. You know, a, a solid, you know, I, I didn't actually find a good number for this. I know I did. Like, I, I had a number during that episode, the 600 million years in 60 minutes. I couldn't find the same number again. Because I looked hmm. back in our notes and I looked in where I remember doing the research for that episode and I couldn't find it again. So I'm not going to speculate, but it was it was very warm um, relative to today. Uh, it sort of cooled throughout the period, though. And then by the end, it was real cold. More on that later. And uh, th- this world, that, that, that sort of contributes to the heat is... 
what I was sort of getting at, I was almost just completely forgot about that and moved on. Very uncharacteristic of me, I know. Um, <laughs> but it being hot at the beginning means that there was very little ice on the planet. And when there's no ice, that raises sea levels. Uh, also, it being warm just expands the volume of water. That's something that like people kind of forget about when it comes to climate change stuff and rising sea levels. Cause like, yeah, if you melt ice that's on a continent and it goes into the water, that's going to raise sea levels. That one's pretty obvious. But if you raise the temperature of water, it's volume expands. Ooh, I didn't even think about that one. That's right. It's, it's essentially, it's the same effect as if you, you know, have a balloon you blow it up and then you heat up the air in the balloon. You don't change the the amount of air in the balloon, but if you just heat it up, it'll expand. I mean, this sounds like like when I'm you're in your intro to physics class and you're mm -hmm. calculating the velocity of things and you're like, ignore air resistance for right yeah. now. It's like, oh my God, we have to include this. On right. Like, and so that is something that is, you know, when you're talking about the scale of the entire planet's ocean, that's a pretty significant factor. Uh, that's just a lot of volume to increase. So, um, and then also there hadn't been a lot of, at this point in time, recent mountain building events to sort of uplift the continents. So the continents sat pretty low, which allowed them to be flooded quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why there wasn't a ton of mountain building events that, that were relatively recent. There were some really old ones, like the one that built the Adirondacks uh, in New York and a lot of the, like the very base layers of like the other parts of the Appalachians. That happened about a billion years or so ago. So, but that was sort of the, one of the most recent major mountain building events. Um, but at this point, Pangea was not a thing yet. So Which, we are pre-Pangea. This is not like Pangea has broken up. We are pre-Pangea. No. Right. So this is pre-Pangea. And then obviously when all the continents move together like that, that creates a lot of mountains. So um, because that had not happened, not a ton of mountains had been built or were actively being built at this time, which helped keep sea levels pretty high because the, the land was pretty low. Okay. And then some so basic geography. Yeah. 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 All right. Some basic geography stuff. North America and Eurasia were roughly around the equator. Hmm. And Gondwana, which is a, a supercontinent that became part of Pangaea. So it's a like it's like the Robin of supercontinents to Pangaea's Batman. <laughs> uh, so Gondwana was the southern supercontinent made out of what is today South America, Africa, uh, Australia, Antarctica, and India. So all the continents that are sort of in the south, plus India, who used to be in the south, but marched northward uh, after Pangaea broke up. And, and just a quick clarification here, like India was, you know, India is on its own um, plate yes. and it was on um, its own, correct? Sort of. It's sort of connected to Australia, plate now really? there's some weird plate tectonic stuff going on there that it didn't used to be but it now kind of is huh that yeah you know what I, we, need to do? Mm. we need to have some like quick hits where instead of having an hour long like you take 10 minutes and explain something like that to me and we put okay. like you know one or two of those out because that's like that's i'm cool with that, that I that'd know. be a fun yeah. episode yeah that'd be great so i'm gonna i'm right, gonna put that on, so. in the notes real quick because i will forget that <laughs> So India and Australia share a plate. Um, so at this time, so India is kind of off doing its own thing. And what else was not connected to um, Gondwana? So G Gondwana altogether. So Gondwana. India was part of it at this point. Oh, it was. I'm sorry. Yeah. So India broke off um, when Pangaea broke off. That was one of the first things to break off of uh, Gondwana. Because mm -hmm. basically Pangaea is made out of Gondwana, which, was, which has been together, you know, by this point for a couple hundred million years, but even by this point. Um, so Pangaea basically formed when Gondwana collided with North America and Eurasia. At this point, North America was off doing its own thing. 
Eurasia was off doing its own thing, and then Gondwana was really far south. And again, Gondwana today is all the continents in the Southern Hemisphere, plus India. Gotcha. But if you noticed, if North America and Eurasia are at the equator, and Gondwana's in the south, that leaves a lot of open real estate. It would seem to. The almost the entire northern hemisphere was covered in ocean. There were no continents up there. I'm not even sure what I mean by the following question, but were the oceans were the oceans similar to what we have today? Like I understand the sea levels were higher, but like did they function in the same way? Were there still ocean currents and similar yes. kind of marine life? Marine life we will talk a lot about. Um, okay. but currents were definitely still a thing. Ocean currents are really hard to model, though, um, because say like there's back in time or today, both. Oh, really? Okay. Um, I mean, to, obviously, we we at least understand the current paths of currents that we have today, um, mm -hmm. but how they change over time is a little mysterious, um, because today you could you know drop a buoy. Or how, or something, some other method to study currents and just see. All right, this current goes from here to here. Relatively simple, um, but in the past, you know, because many things drive currents, um, and it's almost a little bit of like a, like the butterfly effect, because currents are affected by temperature, salinity, um, various other different chemistry things. So it's like if you change one thing. How much does that actually change it? If you change, you know, if you change the salinity just a little bit, it, that could throw off your current completely, or it could tweak it just a little bit. So it's, mm -hmm. and that's something, yeah, right. Too many butterfly effects going into looking at previous ocean currents, essentially. Right. And that's basically what the movie, um, what is, what is the Jake Gyllenhaal Apocalypse the movie. The day, the day after, after tomorrow. tomorrow? Yeah. Um, the that's the, that was the premise of that movie, was that global warming changed ocean currents and brought an Arctic current down uh, the eastern coast of North America. Gotcha. Okay. That That's sort of the premise of that movie. And it's right. like, would, would that happen with like New York freezing solid that quickly? No, obviously not. Um but we don't have a perfect understanding of how climate change affects currents, let alone 400 and, you know, 80 million years of climate change and climate shifts, plus all the plates moving around and stuff. So currents were a thing, and we're going to talk about them a little bit later. But um, as for, you know, actually having names of currents, they flowed from here to here. That's a little less solid. Understood. Sorry to uh, to derail us on that. No, that's okay. That was a really good question. Um, especially when you're talking about such a gigantic ocean. And so that ocean has a really fun name. And it's called, the, the ocean is called Panthalassa. Which Pan just means, oh, wow. all right. right, just like Pangea. You know, Pan meaning all. Right. Gia or Gaia, I guess is like the actual Greek, how you would say that, but meaning Earth. Panthalassa means all ocean. So it's frequently kind of called the great ocean. Right. Okay. Um, and speaking of oceans, this was a miraculous time to be a critter living in the oceans. It was nice and warm. There were lots and lots of very shallow seas. So obviously Panthalassa, if you were out in the middle of it, that's pretty deep. You're going to be really far from any continents. That's going to be really deep, but mm -hmm. With the continents being so low lying and sea levels being so high, that created a lot of what are called epicontinental seas. That is when you have continental crust that has been flooded. Because you think of oceans like the Atlantic and the Pacific today, that is ocean crust, which tends to be thinner and lies really low. And that's where you get the deepest, you know, ocean plains. But, um, you know, certain places, like I think the Mediterranean, uh, don't quote me on that. I don't know that for sure, but I think the Mediterranean is continental crust. Um, 
there are several other like seas, you know, that, that are like that, that are, uh, I think the Caribbean parts of the Caribbean are Ebby continental with continental crust underneath them um, instead of ocean crust. But it basically just makes for shallow seas where sunlight can get all the way to the bottom and uh, makes for a, just a really great place to live in general. If you are living in the water. So marine life was doing pretty well at this time then. They were doing amazingly. Until and if you remember back to episode 50 about the Cambrian explosion, you know, life during the Cambrian explosion diversified in uh, new forms. So this was the first time where like eyes developed or the first time where heads developed stuff like mm-hmm. that. Right. Right. That happened in the Cambrian explosion, but in the early Ordovician, there was another huge, huge, huge radiation that was, instead of an expansion of new forms, was just a, an expansion in diversity. So there'd be lots of similar things instead of just a whole whole new branches popping up. So it's those new branches creating leaves, essentially. New branches creating leaves. Okay, that's one way to put it. Yeah, of uh, you know, following a bit of a metaphor from last episode about the the tree of life. Which, by the way, if you haven't check out that last episode on the tree of life, I, Gavin did a really nice job breaking down exactly how that works and how it doesn't work. Why? Thank you. Um, and so, life in the Ordovician period was really popping off. Things were super, super diverse, and uh, I'll touch on this a little bit more, but. This is basically as diverse as the oceans would be for uh, at least, let me, I think I cited somewhere later, about the next 340 million years. Which once again, like we talked about before, that's a significant chunk of time. That is a huge amount of time. So what kind of critters are we actually talking about here that are doing so well? This is a very classic sort of, Paleozoic fauna, and I'll explain more what that sort of means in a bit. But the main things were, so things like your predators, that were your nautiloid cephalopods. So cephalopods being things like squid, octopus, things like that. Nautiloids uh, were some of the more primitive forms. We still have one of them around today. Uh, But they had shells, shells. the one that we have around today looks superficially like an ammonite, which we have called uh, previously the swirly shelled squid boys. <laughs> yeah. Some of the ones around at this time uh, didn't have the curled shells like that. Uh, they had just sort of longer pointy shells. Some of them could get, you know, a meter or bigger, just the shell, let alone all the arms and things hanging out. Those were your main predators at this time, not fish like we think of today. Uh, Things like snails and bivalves were really popping off as well. They were sort of just showing up and started to get uh, some prominence. Early eurypterids or sea scorpions that became really big uh, right after uh, the Ordovician period. Uh, Trilobites were very, very diverse at this time. Trilobites being your very classic... um, I've heard them described... A handful of ways but if you've seen sort of a fossil bug looking thing i was gonna say like water bugs right yeah that's that you're thinking of a trilobite um i've also heard them called undersea roombas which i also quite like uh, <laughs> so these guys were extremely diverse at this point and spoilers this is as diverse as they would ever be uh we'll t- more on that later too but they had all sorts of forms. They had some predatory forms. They had some forms that, again, just sort of roombud around the seafloor. They had some forms that were purely uh, planktonic that would be up in the water column, just sort of floating on the currents and things like you would think of with like jellyfish almost today. Um, so they were doing all sorts of crazy different things, uh, not just scuttling around the seafloor. Crinoids, which... Uh, we've talked about in 
uh, the YouTube exclusive talking about uh, Pokemon and the paleontology of Pokemon, but also talking about them in that episode of the podcast as well. Uh, but they are more colloquially called sea lilies, a little bit misleading because they are, in fact, animals, not plants. But they're related to starfish, basically a starfish flipped upside down with a big stalk that attaches to the seafloor. Yes. Uh, brachiopods, which, if you're not familiar, are very clam-like, but not clams. They feed in a very different way and are not closely related almost at all. But if you saw one, you would be forgiven if, if you said that was a clam. But similarly, they had, you know, two shells, you know, one on either side, and the actual animal lived inside of them. Um, particularly, those are sort of classified into two groups. There's the articulate, basically describing how the two halves fit together. They articulate together quite well. And then the inarticulate brachiopods, which have a less um, solid joint between the two halves. Uh, both were doing really well, but I made that distinction for, for a reason uh, that I'll circle back to in a little bit. And I'm mostly just going through all of this to point out, A, there was a lot going on. Things were really diverse and it was just really weird compared to today because everything for the most part so far has been stuff that we have still today, if not in the same sort of quantities. But I was just about to ask, so like, with all everything we're talking about here today, like none of this stuff is around today, correct? Yes and no. Um, so nautiloids, there's I, one species, I think, maybe two around mm-hmm. today. Um, snails and bivalves are extremely common. They weren't as common at this time. They're Like I said, we're just sort of getting their start. But uh, eurypterids, not around today. Trilobites, not around today. Crinoids are around, but not nearly as ecologically important today as they were at this time. Brachiopods, well, I'll talk about that a bit more. They are still around today, but similar story to crinoids. Um, and the, the rest of the things that I have sort of on my list here are uh, things that we mostly don't have today, but that were still popping off at this time. Um a group of animals called graptolites, which are really hard to explain, but they're basically sort of a, a colonial, just sort of floating organism. They made like a little structure. Uh, think of it almost like a floating coral. They're not really closely related to coral, but they were colonial like a coral is, but instead of sitting on the seafloor, uh, they would sort of, float around and they did have sort of a hard part so i don't know exactly how they sort of floated through the water but they had i don't know if they had some kind of air pocket or something to that effect but um yeah a very interesting group of animals that we don't really have today so as there's a uh like a truck backing yeah. up in the uh, in the background of gavin saying so the fossil record for all of these is the fossil record strong with all of these kind of amazing uh, okay Ordovician fossil record is great all is there over a the world. Reason for that? Uh, lots and lots of those shallow seas. If you want to be preserved mm-hmm. as a fossil, that is an excellent place to live. Perfect. Okay. Um, around this time, we also get the first fishy organisms that you would see that and very clearly be like, "You're a fish. You're a weird fish, but you're a fish." Um, specifically, specifically conodonts, uh, which look very much like eels. Uh, but they have a very particular tooth structure. We will have an episode about conodonts at some point. They're a really interesting group, Um, but they were jawless. Jawed fish had not evolved yet. Um, And then also with them, we had a group that's called the ostracoderms. Again, jawless fish, but with bone armor around sort of their head and their front half or so. Uh, really, really neat groups that, again, we, we will talk about these in a future episode. Um, but just to point out that, like, our ancestors were around, not really doing all the things we see them doing today. <laughs> so that was, those, those are the uh, the organisms that we wanted to talk about here. What what comes next? 
So uh, that was all about animals. What are we I'm going to touch really quickly on plants. Yeah. All right, fine. So green algae was really common around this time as it has been for a, a very long time in earth history. Even at this point, it had been around for a really long time. But like same kind of algae that we have today? More or less. Just sort of uh, single-celled to potentially like colonial organisms living in the water, doing photosynthesis, that kind of thing. But not true plants as you would think of them today. Because even things like seaweed, um, you know, things like seaweed have are almost like whales in that their ancestors used to live on land, but then they went back to the water. So... How, how did it, de- it depends things... what you're calling seaweed, but like sea grasses, for example. How do these things fossilize? Or like, I assume, do, I assume they don't fossilize because there's no hard parts in these plants. Like what, how do we know these things existed? I guess is my question. So a lot of uh, like oceanic algae like that do make like a little shell around themselves. Wow. Well, yeah, that's what wow, uh, okay. creates a lot of like limestones and things like that are made from single celled okay. organisms that do that. Huh, okay. um, and then I, I specifically touch on plants here, but not just for the algae, but because land plants first show up in sort of the middle of the Ordovician period, but there are basically just mosses. So nothing more than an inch or two high off the ground. And that's the real thing where I was like, it would depend where you were, if you would recognize this as earth or not, because, you know, there's no plants, there's pretty much no animals. I I think maybe you might get a couple like invertebrate things that might pop up onto a beach every now and then, but that would be essentially it. There were, there were no ecosystems really on land at this point. Wow. Okay. And so with that, that sort of covers most of the life, but something I really, really want to emphasize here is that, Life was really having a grand old time during the Ordovician, mostly in terms of its ecological complexity, because up till this point, it was really simple food webs and food chains. It was mostly like filter feeders would eat, you know, small planktonic things out of the water, and then things would eat them. That was pretty much the extent of the food chain. And then things, okay. th- and then you know, things like trilobites would eat, you know, poop or dead things on the seafloor, and that's that's the extent of the food chain. Um, I mean, that sounds really like a food chain, not like a food web. That was sort of like the you know, you know, unlocking mystery of middle school is that it's actually a food web, not a food chain. Right. So this kind of sounds like it's a pretty, pretty linear progression. Right, and that's how things were for especially the early Cambrian, but even through you know a decent chunk of the Cambrian, but by the Ordovician. Things were a lot more complex, uh, especially suspension feeding, which are things like crinoids or what corals do as well, where they have sort of little tentacles where they just sort of filter stuff out of the water as it flows through their arms or other appendages. Um, And this is when sort of ecological tiering in suspension feeding actually sort of happened for the first time. So think of it sort of like a forest, if you've ever been in a forest. So you have your sort of grasses or mosses on the ground. A little bit higher than that, you have your ferns. A little bit higher than that, you have, you know, your your shrubs or small trees. And then above that, you have your big canopy forest. So imagine that, but on the seafloor. And that's happened for the first time ever during this time. First time ever. Okay. And so, as I said a little bit ago, the Ordovician is the most diverse that Earth's oceans would be, again, for the next roughly 340 million years until the middle of the Cretaceous period. A very long time. Right. We're talking about lots of long time scales today. Yes. And so, a big question of how do we know, especially that last bit, how do we know that? You know, who, I assume you're who actually, I, I sure am. And so I would be, I was going to sort of get on a little bit of a high horse and be like, I would be remiss, but no, my, uh, <laughs> my undergraduate professor and advisor would 
be very angry with me if I did not mention these couple of particular researchers from the early 80s. So there's a very, very famous um, paper from 1982 by a pair of researchers named Raup and Sepkowski. So these guys, I believe, that were... Like a fun time. Raup, that sounds like a law firm, actually. Raup and Sepkowski? Like, a little bit, yeah. Right, they do, like, patent law or something. <laughs> uh, but these guys were, I think, at the University of Chicago at the time. And anyone who has ever taken a paleontology class should know these two names. Like, if you were not taught these at some point, uh, you should get your money back. <laughs> okay. So, what these two did... I'm glad it's only taken us 59 episodes to bring them up. <laughs> like, I have talked about them sort of indirectly, about some of their work. I've just never mentioned them. Um, but so, th what these two did, that nobody else had really been able to do up to that point, was plot... Marine invertebrate diversity through time from the Cambrian period all the way to the recent. And when you do that with the resolution that they were able to do, because it's not like people hadn't tried, they just didn't have the resolution or computing power to really be able to do that up right. till this point. And so when you do that kind of thing, you find a lot of patterns for the first one to plot that many things over 540 million years of time. So, a big thing that they noticed were what are today called the three evolutionary faunas. So a fauna is just a collection of animals. And so they have sort of been subdivided into the Cambrian fauna, which as you might guess, uh, was most common during the Cambrian period and the early parts of the Paleozoic around the Cambrian that is mostly made up of things like trilobites, those inarticulate brachiopods, and uh, a group of uh, mollusks called monoplacophorins or monoplacophorins, depending on how you pronounce it. That's just a fun name to say. It really is. Um, so, if you know, do you know what a chitin is? Not a clue. So, it's a type of mollusk that um, basically imagine a snail sort of but instead of a swirly shell it makes more of like a oval flatter shield sort of shaped shell what what animal is this so it's, it's uh they're called monoplacophorins but i guess today there's a separate but related group called chitons hmm. okay so but yeah so they're related to things like snails and uh clams and such but Today, chitons make it up out of multiple sort of plates of shell. They're a part of a group called polyplacophorins. You know, poly meaning many. These monoplacophorins made it up of just a single shell part. Again, pretty archaic. They weren't around for a long time. That's why they're part of the Cambrian, because they didn't last terribly long. So I, I have sort of a question about this episode as we're yeah. going through here. So... Uh, we were talking about an Ordovician extinction. Like, I'm, we, I'm we'll get there. For, we'll get there. I'm waiting for a bunch of crap to start dying because it sounds like everything's going great. And it I always feel like does. I've been lied to. It always <laughs> does. Okay. As long as we're going to get there, because I like this is this is almost sounding like a happy story. Like we got a bunch of animals doing great. We got you know continents colliding together. I like. I'm I'm really curious what's going to go wrong. That's going to wind up causing this mass extinction event. We we will for sure get there. Um, okay. But yeah, so we have the Cambrian fauna. We have the Paleozoic fauna, which is some of the more derived brachiopods, crinoids, cephalopods, uh, anthozoans, which are a specific type of coral that was not uh, around in the Cambrian, and then things like sea stars. And then the modern fauna is the third one, and that is things that we kind of are most prevalent today. There would be things like your bivalves, your clams and oysters and such, your osteichthys, your bony fish, chondrichthys, your sharks and stingrays and such, and sea urchins. That makes up the, the modern fauna. And so the Ordovician was pretty much the only time in Earth history where all three of these different faunas were present in noticeable, you know, ecologically significant amounts. So that makes the Ordovician a really interesting time to study sort of the transition between these three 
major sort of ecological modes that the oceans have taken over over the history of life. And so the plots that they made that were uh, that they found the, all these patterns on are often called Sepkoski curves. Raup kind of gets the short end of the stick on that one. Uh, well, his name is shorter, so do yeah, it, like Sepkoski. That's a fun name to say. Yeah. What, what was it? His name Rep. Raup. Raup. Like, hey, sorry, man. One syllable. That's all you get. Mm-hmm. But one of the most noticeable things in the Sepkoski curves are these big dents in the curve of species over time. And these are what, what we know what as... What do you mean by dense? What is that? What is big, that mean? big drops. Okay. So it's like a nice curve or sort of plot where it sort of increases, like number of species, basically. Um, so it's sort is of... New right. species or like total species? To- total exists? species. Okay. So it sort of increases quite a lot in the Cambrian, even more at the beginning of the Ordovician. And then it sort of drops right at the end of the Ordovician. Then it drops again at the end of the Devonian, drops at the end of the Permian, drops at the end of the Triassic, and drops at the end of the Cretaceous. And that's how we identify our mass extinction events, I assume? That is you know, like very classically how we came to know the quote-unquote big five mass extinctions. Um, and so the Ordovician mass extinctions, and, and I want to be, be really clear, those the big five are not necessarily the biggest and definitely not the only mass extinctions, but they were the first ones that were like immediately noticeable. They've been able to make the biggest imprint on science to this point, just because they've, we've known about them longer. Right. And so the end order vision mass extinction is very strange because a, it's the first one. B It is the only mass extinction that we've really had without life on land, which changes just a lot of how it's talked about. Because even though, like, for example, the end Cretaceous, you mostly hear about things, you know, like the dinosaurs going extinct, how that's often studied is actually looking at marine invertebrates. Because you can get way more chemical stuff uh, from the ocean than you can on land. Uh, C, it didn't fundamentally change all that much by the end of it, which we'll talk about. And uh, D, this is one of the only extinctions that is really cold. The rest are caused typically by warming. This one, like I said earlier, got real cold. Huh, okay. The, I don't know why the, the real cold is sticking out in my brain, but I don't have a question. It's just interesting. Well, we, we did talk about it a little bit, but I'll, I'll get there in a sec. Overall, this extinction is kind of often cited as the second worst out of the big five uh, after the end Permian, which we've talked about a whole bunch. And all said, over 100 families went extinct, which is a lot. At least 49% of all genera, the plural of genus, went extinct, and roughly 85% of all species went extinct. 85%. That's a lot. That It's a, so much. 80, I mean, what, when we're calculating that number, what counts? And what I mean by that is, I assume we're including both animals and plants. And I assume so, we're not including things like bacteria and funguses and whatnot, but like what, what counts in that number? So that is typically, wow, there's a lot of activity going on outside the hotel. Yeah, you uh, okay, Gavin? I'm, I mean, I'm fine. Are, are we having a mass extinction event on this podcast where 50% of the podcast it goes extinct? I hope not. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so typically when talking about extinction rates, it is... Uh, talk about marine invertebrates. Mass extinctions in plants are really not well understood, uh, typically because the plant fossil record is is better than most people think, but not nearly as good as we would like it to be. Um, and at this point, you know, studying particular species of bacteria, A, is even complicated today. Bacteria are really weird and don't 
work as species the same way that animals do and are a lot harder to study because of that. But that's a whole different can of worms that I don't really want to get into because bacteria scare me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this is so yeah, talking about marine yeah. invertebrate animals. And so this extinction is really most extinctions actually are talked about in pulses because very rarely is it a single thing happened. You know, there's no Thanos snap and then all the life goes away. It's not really how it happens. So this one in particular is, yeah, right. Uh, This one in particular is often talked about in two pulses. And this is mostly because this is a, uh, an association or a, an extinction that is really heavily associated with glaciers, which grow and recede. And if you remember way back to episode 51, where we talked about snowball earth, I mentioned this time period because, oh boy, was there a lot of glaciers. Uh, Depending on what source you look at, the glaciers were around as extensive as they were during the Pleistocene, you know, the Ice Age not terribly long ago. Not nearly snowball earth levels, but really extensive glaciers. And, you know, the world was... Like I said, doing all hunky-dory before that, it was nice and warm. There were lots of shallow oceans, and glaciers tend to reverse both of those things. And because of that, a lot of stuff died. Like 85% of the species on Earth. Yeah, pretty much. And so a lot of this is actually fairly intuitive, which is weird for an extinction. A lot of things with extinctions, like I've said, tend to be more complicated than you think. This one seems relatively straightforward, which I'm honestly a little bit hesitant to say, A, because it's the oldest, which means that we just inherently have the least amount of information about it. Um, So it's probably being underestimated how complex it was. That's not to say that there's not people still studying this and working on it and that we don't have questions about it anymore because we definitely do. Uh, But it's just a lot of the steps kind of make sense and we have good evidence for what happened. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing this then if it kind of makes a logical, you know, the progression makes logical sense. I'm looking forward to getting this. So in, in the episode about snowball earth, uh, you know, I basically said it's, it's much easier to, for ice and, and big ice sheets to form when uh, there is land on the poles, it's you, you don't really get glaciers growing on water, or at least forming on water. They sort of extend into water from the land, like in Antarctica, for example. Um, and throughout most of the Ordovician, Gondwana was basically just continuing to march further and further south until it was basically centered on the South Pole. So that was sort of step one in getting glaciers to begin with. And also in that episode, I also mentioned that, you know, it kind of makes sense if there is less CO2, less greenhouse gases, that's going to drive down temperatures, right? That also just from, if you're even a little bit aware of modern climate change, uh, you probably know that CO2 increases global temperatures. I think I've heard that once or twice. Yeah. So if you have a way to remove a lot of CO2, that will decrease temperatures. And so A, probably not the major thing, but there were plants for the first time in the history of Earth. Uh, That wasn't something that was around beforehand. So that's just a new thing sucking up carbon dioxide, not by any means the, the major player by itself, but it was a factor. The shallow seas were very, very productive, meaning all of those photosynthetic algae in the water were sucking up lots of carbon dioxide, and then they would all, you know, they eventually die and sink and bury all of that carbon uh, in the ocean. So that's just another way to remove carbon dioxide. But the big one at this time was that the weathering 
of rocks, specifically rocks with a lot of like silica, like quartz in them, the chemical weathering of those rocks removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Is that something you can explain to me? How does that happen? Uh, chemistry reasons. So basically most people think of, most people mistake weathering for erosion because those are not the same thing. Erosion. Definitions, please. Yeah. Erosion is sort of the physical moving. So that is a rock flowing down a river right. or wind sort of sand blasting through a rock, picking up sand and sort of knocking off little pieces of the rock with other pieces of rock that it picks up. Mm -hmm. So erosion is a physical thing. Weathering is a chemical thing. So wouldn't that also manifest like physically though? A little like, yeah, like weathering can break off pieces. Like if there's like a crack in the rock already, that crack will weather quicker than like the inside of the rock. And so that can participate. That's a lot of uh, times how pieces get broken off to be eroded. Okay. Um, but weathering is, is a chemical process. And so the chemical reaction that these rocks have to most of the time turn into clay minerals. So uh, things like feldspars um, will absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to be weathered into clay minerals. That's why sometimes if you go up to a rock, there might be like a little layer of like almost powder on it. Mm -hmm. That's what that is. Okay. The layer of powder on clay, that's the weathering. Right. Okay. And so that process, like I said, removes CO2 from the atmosphere. And if there is more stuff to be weathered, that just inherently increases the amount of weathering and increases the amount of CO2 being sucked out of the atmosphere. And during this time, as Gondwana was continuing to move around, like I said, before this, there really wasn't a ton of mountain building, which is why sea levels were so high because the continents were relatively low. But during the Ordovician, there was a lot of mountain building this sort of toward the end and toward the, or toward the middle going through the latter half of the, of the period. And so that mountain building builds up and exposes a lot of rock, which then gets weathered and sucks you two out of the atmosphere. That's the major player. Okay. So and the, between, the major player of getting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Right. And so that creates, like we talked about a lot in uh, that Snowball Earth episode, a positive feedback loop where you decrease global temperatures which causes glaciers, which decrease global temperatures, which cause more glaciers, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, ice is very reflective. It reflects light and therefore heat back out into space from the sun. And so if you have more glaciers, you reflect more heat and it drives down temperatures more. So once glaciers really start going, uh, it takes a lot, <coughs> humans, uh, to, <laughs> to really knock them off their course. And you know, those glaciers, as they're growing, have to get their water from somewhere. And that somewhere would be all of those wonderful shallow seas that all those little critters loved so much. Mm -hmm. So all those things that were really well adapted to living and, you know, living their best life in those shallow seas, those shallow seas just aren't there anymore. They don't. So is it just, is the logical progression here just that, you're like, I, I don't know if you like I already said it or made the point, but like in my head, it's okay. There's not enough CO or I shouldn't say not enough, but there's just less CO2 in the air, the atmosphere that's causing temperatures to lower. That's causing glaciers to form. Mm -hmm. And just those glaciers, like not a whole lot really lives in ice. And that ice right. is taking the place of all the habitats that used to exist. Is that that logical progression you were talking about? So not so much, but like ice is now covering where the things lived, but mm -hmm. as, as evaporation just naturally happens, uh, there was less precipitation flowing into those seas to refill them because okay. the precipitation was then being locked up as the glaciers instead. Gotcha. Um, so as the glaciers grew, the sea levels dropped 
And A, that's just really bad. You don't have any more spaces to live. And uh, also changing global temperatures like that and adding and removing or adding slash removing uh, a lot of water can really, really mess with ocean chemistry. And a big one that is often cited for this extinction are two factors called anoxia, which means, you know, no, basically no oxygen in the water. That's pretty self-explanatory why uh, that's not great for life. Right. And then another one, which is called euxinia, which is low oxygen, but also a lot of sulfur in the water. How does that and happen? Weird chemistry reasons when there's not a lot of oxygen. And okay. that's as much as I'm going to talk about with that, because like we're already running pretty deep in this podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's um, why you come here. Right. But just know that lots of sulfur is really toxic. So it's not just, you know, not having oxygen. There are animals that are adapted to low oxygen. They're, they're honestly not even all that uncommon, but there are very few animals that are adapted to sulfur, which is like actively toxic for most life. So the first pulse of, oh, also as a side note, this hasn't, I don't believe there's any fossil evidence for this, but um, there may have been like enormous, like ocean wide uh, algal blooms. In the, in the oceans, thanks to lots of new sediments and nutrients from the glaciers, which helped reduce uh, the oxygen in the water because some of the chemistry doesn't quite work out, um, like the math behind it. So it's like, well, maybe, you know, algal blooms reduce oxygen. So maybe that was, you know, a, a factor, just ocean-wide uh, algal blooms, which sounds pretty apocalyptic. <laughs> apocalyptic yeah, that's, I, 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 I would like to see that once and then never again. Right. And so the, the general pattern sort of goes with this extinction that the glaciers grow, cause the extinction in all those shallow seas. That's pulse one. Pulse two is when uh, it, that, that's what causes all the anoxia and the euxinia, weird chemistry stuff as the oceans or as the uh, glaciers recede and sort of shook stuff back up again. Because things sort of adapted to the, like the middle cold times, you know, as long as it doesn't kill everything, some things will adapt to the new conditions. And some things absolutely did. But then when the glaciers melt again, if you didn't get caught by the first pulse, you got caught by the second one. Hmm. There, there was no escape in this, was there? No. And so, all said and done, the glaciers grew and then receded in a span of, depending on what information you're looking at, and this is a really wide span, so take this with a grain of salt, uh, grew and retreated in a span of anywhere from 30 to 1 million years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, okay. So like I, like I said, we still have lots of questions about this. Um, but it is classically sort of interpreted this way. Most things that I found said that the like actual serious glaciation where all this was happening lasted for around 5 million years, which mm -hmm. is much more reasonable. Um, I mean, it's, it's a number that, you know, instead right. of a but it's giant like, range. Yeah. Yeah. And so a big factor in this, cause I said earlier that this didn't really ecologically change all that much, which if you think 85% of species dying, how could that not? change up the, the way the world functions. And so it, it was a really big factor of who actually died because a big part of it were the, those brachiopods and trilobites. Trilobites really got hit hard in that 70% of genera. So like a genus level, which would be well over 80% of trilobite species going extinct. Uh, there were several entire like branches of trilobites that went extinct. Um, same thing with brachiopods as well. And uh, deep water groups were really, really heavily affected because of all that weird ocean chemistry stuff. So like they basically, if you're adapted to low oxygen, like the deep oceans tend to be, ocean currents might change and actually bring you some oxygen, which might be good if that's what you're used to. But if you're not used to it, that's really bad for you. 
So just lots of change to ocean chemistry just kind of hit the entire ocean, but particularly the, the deep stuff. Cause if you're adapted to deep water, you can just move into deeper water, but you couldn't really do that here. I mean, that actually makes a decent amount of sense. Uh, a lot of planktonic stuff, so stuff floating around in the water was also really heavily affected because they don't really control where they go. And if the ocean currents change and, you know, start pushing you to somewhere where you're not adapted to be, there's really not much you can do about it. You just die. Right. Um, so graptolites, which were those colonial floating coral things, they have a really hard time. And depending on what sources you look at, they had maybe 20 species survive total out of, uh, several hundred. <laughs> oh yeah. That, that's not a good uh, percentage. No. Um, all solitary corals die. So corals, most people think of as like your big reef building things that are colonial. There are even today, uh, solitary corals there. They don't build reefs so much, but at this point in time, they were a lot more ecologically significant than they are today. All of them are gone. They come back as a new lineage, but all of the lineages that were solitary are gone. Uh, even like the mm -hmm. colonial reefs and corals that we have today, uh, they also were not doing well. Corals never really do well. <laughs> they always get the, um, uh, the crap out of the stick. Yeah. Those nautiloids, those um, squid and, and octopus relatives, they decrease by about 80% of species. There are a couple orders of nautiloids, so like very large scale groups within nautiloids that go extinct. And that Cambrian fauna overall is really, really hard hit. Over like almost half of their families go extinct. And like, if you think, granted, last episode we talked about how levels of taxonomy are kind of a thing. <laughs> so... Yeah. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go listen to that episode. But and they're useful to talk about in this context. Right. Um, so almost half of the families went extinct for the Cambrian stuff. For the Paleozoic fauna, they did a little better, about 30% of families. And the modern fauna, the stuff that's more representative of, of what we have today, only about 5-ish percent of families went extinct. So that's a, a little foreshadowing for the next uh, like 450-ish million years. Good job by nature on that one. Yeah. And in the aftermath of this, basically, trilobites never really recover, sadly. Uh, they were at their peak in the Ordovician, and then they just kind of slowly, they pick back up a little bit. Um, the end Devonian mass extinction doesn't really do them any favors, and then they they die out sometime in the Permian. So they, they make it for another 180 million years, which is good, but they never really do as well as they did uh, before this extinction. So can we point to the, you know, the Ordovician mass extinction as like, you know, the cause for their demise? Cause that sounds like they existed for a long, long time after this. Yeah. So if you look at like their species diversity, yeah, it does kind of seem like that because they, like I said, really pop up and, and so, well, they, they do really well in the Cambrian and then do even better in the Ordovician up until this point, they dip, they recover a bit, but they never get even close. So this is sort of like, not the last nail in the coffin, but like the first couple <laughs> nails in the coffin <laughs> for sure. Okay. Gotcha. Um, but that's really the only group that's like super heavily, you know, impacted that doesn't really recover all other major groups recover relatively quickly. And so there's a lot of different theories about this and, and or like hypotheses about this. And that's one of the big questions that people are still trying to work on here is like, why, why didn't things change? You know, because every other mass extinction sort of cleared the way for like another new group to sort of move in and be more successful than they previously were. That didn't really happen here. So ecosystems fundamentally looked the same. Um, and I've, I've seen a couple things that sort of suggest that maybe a lot of keystone species survived. Things like equivalent to uh, 
So like in North America today, beavers are extremely important to the way, uh, especially in like Northern North America, ecosystems function without beavers blocking up rivers and things like North America would look very different ecologically. Um, but it's like, if beavers, if there was a mass extinction in North America, if beavers went extinct, they would do, you know, things might look pretty good still. If beaver, if, yeah. So things that were sort of depended on by lots of other organisms, if those hung on, new things might've been able to adapt to take advantage of those now open positions. If that makes sense. Can you say it one more time just to make sure that I get it? So if there's like one particular organism who, by just doing what they do, creates other niches. And so say the things that fill those niches go extinct, but the thing creating all the niches don't. Yeah, it seems like it would be just a recipe for, you know, similar organisms to reappear down the road. Right. Okay. And so yeah, no, that makes total sense. Coming out of the out, the, the end of this, we still had those nautiloids being the predators. We, st we, st we did still have trilobites, even if they weren't doing as well. Uh, still had crinoids doing their filter feeding things. Same thing with brachiopods. We had different ones. You know, they weren't the same species beforehand, but they were still doing ecologically the same things as the ones that died fundamentally. And then mm -hmm. environmental conditions seem to go back to sort of normal-ish fairly quickly after the glaciers melt. And uh, if you somehow made it through the glaciers, then, you know, congrats. You're, you're already pretty much well adapted to life afterward. And then just really quickly uh, about how the glaciers melted. This one is, you know, we, we know how glaciers melt, uh, you know, producing CO2, the, the earth's cycle of that doesn't stop during times of glaciers. So eventually that will just build up until the point where uh, the glaciers lose that fight against increasing temperatures from the CO2 and they eventually just kind of melt. So the earth's carbon cycle through things like volcanoes eventually will just put out enough carbon dioxide to melt the glaciers more or less. And that's how we kind of get out of, was this snowball earth? Not quite. Okay. Uh, about as close as you get without being truly snowball earth. But like I said, this was comparable to like the previous ice age that we just had in you know, a couple thousand years ago. Gotcha. Okay. So, so, but like this, so it wasn't quite snowball earth, but it was, you know, the rising CO2 from different geologic processes, you know, combated the rising glaciers. Right. And, and also when global temperatures decrease, that decreases the rate of weathering just because chemical processes happen faster when it's warmer. So all those rocks sucking up the CO2, were just doing that slower because it was colder. Or even in some cases, if the glacier is covering it, that just decreases the amount of CO2 that those rocks have access to. So the glaciers sort of slowed down their own process of being built by growing a little bit. So it's a little bit of a negative feedback loop thrown in there too. Um, and yeah, things kind of cruise into the Silurian period. Kind of just coasting after the extinction. And I, I want to have a little footnote here about the Silurian period, which, okay. which comes after the Ordovician. So uh, depending on what source you look at, things recovered, like I said, relatively quickly in terms of like ecology, but not so much in terms of species. So the number of species doesn't really get back to where it was until a, a good chunk into the Silurian. The Silurian is relatively short and like I said at the beginning, there's a couple periods where I'm like, ah, not much happened <laughs> during that time. <laughs> and the Silurian's one of them. So uh, I will try my best to do an episode about the Silurian at some point. Um, but we will cross that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> All right. And so does that close the book on the Ordovician mass extinction? It sure does. And I know that I, I'm sure that I left a bunch of stuff out. Um, but this was a really, really interesting time just because of all of the neat new ecological 
advancements that happened. And then with it also just being the first big mass extinction, um, it always has a little bit of a place in my heart because there's lots of Ordovician rocks in New York as well. Uh, so that's, that's a big part of uh, a lot of the fossils that help us figure out uh, some of the stuff that happened in the Ordovician come from New York. So special place. Very nice. And so this has been episode 59 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike and that is Gavin. And we will see you next week with episode 60. Take care, everybody.